It turns out one of the biggest differences between great geniuses and everyday people. An everyday person wakes up four o'clock in the morning, they have a crazy idea. They think, I'm no genius, and they go back to sleep. But Leonardo da Vinci or Thomas Edison or Marie Curie has a crazy idea. They wake up at four o'clock in the morning, they write it down in their notebook. Hey guys, today we have an awesome, awesome guest with us. He's Michael Gelb. Michael J. Gelb is the world's leading authority on the application of genius thinking to personal and organizational development. He's a pioneer in the fields of creative thinking, accelerated learning, and innovative leadership. Gelb leads seminars for organizations such as DuPont, Merck, Microsoft, Nike, YPO, etc. Michael brings more than 40 years of experience as a professional speaker, seminar leader, and organizational consultant to his diverse international clientele. Michael Gelb is the author of 17 books on creativity and innovation, including the international bestseller, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, which is my favorite, <laughs> uh, which has been translated into 25 languages and has appeared on the Washington Post, Amazon, and the New York Times bestseller list i'm very honored to invite michael gelb to the show thanks gelb for coming to the show great to be with you thank you thank you michael michael before we go into the questions can you share where can people connect with you sure um, my website is michaelgelb.com that's g-e-l-b michaelgelb.com we've got tons of free stuff videos articles all sort of links to everything you could ever possibly want to utilize your creative power and potentiality. Thank you, Michael. Michael, my first question is, can you explain what is conjugate ad solvendum? Sure. Oh, thanks for asking that. So I like, I, I like to have mottos. I like to have aphorisms, sayings that remind me of important wisdom. And when I want to make up my own motto, I make it up in Latin because it seems more important that way. <laughs> so one of my best friends is a scholar of Latin. So I always check with him. I don't just use the internet because, you know, you can get things wrong that way. Yeah. So conjugere ad salvendum is Latin for connect before solving. Connect before solving solving so a few years ago i published a book called the art of connection the art of connection and the reason i wrote that book is that after so many years of teaching people to be more creative to be more innovative what became very clear is that you can have the most creative idea in the world but if you don't know how to connect with other people if you don't know how to work effectively with other people it's probably not going to happen so it requires relationships, building relationships, connecting with others. And the world has gotten so fast, so quick. Everybody wants results now. Everything is driven towards transactions as opposed to the importance of connection itself. And what I've realized, just very simple, is that when you connect with another human being first, it's much easier to find solutions. Everybody already knows this intuitively. You know, we say, are you simpatico? Do you have rapport? Oh, I have a good feeling about this person. I don't know, I just like this person. And when you like somebody, you're more likely to wanna to do business with them. So take a little bit of time and focus on the human connection before trying to solve whatever the issue is. That's what conjungere ad salvenda means, connect before solving. Thank you, uh, Michael. That's awesome. <laughs> Michael, how to master the art of connection? Well, the first thing is to recognize how important it is and to focus on what are your strengths? what are your own weaknesses? A lot of times people delude themselves about how they're perceived by others because they don't seek feedback. So learning to be open to feedback, to get 
honest opinions from other people about how you're perceived. Now, I, I've had to do this for my whole career because I'm a professional speaker. And at the end of my talks, people fill out a questionnaire and they say, well, I couldn't stand that guy. You know, he was an arrogant pain in the ass. And that's when, <laughs> so when, when I was younger, I, I was shocked to discover that I came across as a little bit arrogant, sometimes very arrogant, like a, you know, a young know-it-all. And I realized, oh, I can see how that might be so. This is interfering with my ability to connect with people. So let me be more open. Let me be more curious. Let me focus more on the audience. Let me stop being a big show off. I learned that very, I learned that in my 20s because I listened to the feedback I got from, from the audience. And then I, I realized I, I could talk to an audience. I could ask the audience questions that, that my, my talk, even though I'm very interested in my subjects, I'm interested in Leonardo da Vinci, I'm interested in Thomas Edison. I actually do know a lot about them. I've studied them for years and years. But it was actually an editor of mine gave me some feedback. He said, you think your book is about Leonardo da Vinci. This is before the book was even published. He said, your book is not about Leonardo da Vinci. He said, your book is about the reader. So I got this feedback and said, oh, my book is about the reader. My talk is about the listener. Hmm. And that changed everything in terms of how I wrote and how I presented And over the years. I've only become more and more humble <laughs> because reality will do that. Experience will do that if you're paying attention. One of my other mottos, this one isn't in Latin, it's just in English, is if you're not humble, you're not paying attention. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Michael, what are your views on addiction to digital devices these days? Oh, wow. Well, I think we're all guilty. It's, it's just how bad is the addiction? <laughs> Do we have any freedom at all? <laughs> I mean, they're designed to get us addicted. They're designed to keep us hooked. The colors, the, the, the shapes. I mean, it's all, it's not just random the way it's, the way it's done. Uh, so, one has to be digitally literate. It's a big part of our world. And the truth is, if you use it intelligently, it's an amazing blessing. I mean, you can get access, we can get access to all knowledge instantaneously if we know how to ask the question, if we know how to be critical thinkers and not just assume that, oh, it appeared on my computer or my iPhone, therefore it must be true. That's a problem. Yes. <laughs> and of course, Having said all that, it's really important to have a discipline to put it down, put it away. Don't look at it for a while. Now, this morning, I got up extra early and I went for a walk outside for an hour. I didn't look at my phone once. And I, instead, I listened to the sound of the birds and it was an amazingly beautiful, energizing morning. Now, a lot of the day today, I will be connected to digital devices. I, we're doing this now. I've got uh, some Zoom meetings later in the day with clients. I've got to receive and send messages. I will probably check what's happening in the world once or twice. But then I'll, you know, I'll put it down in between. I will do my Tai Chi. I will go for another walk later on. I won't look at it while I'm having lunch or while I'm having dinner or having a relationship with, you know, I don't text my wife at the table and she doesn't text me back. We actually look each other in the eyes and listen to each other and we're present with each other. So <laughs> that's the way. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Michael, sure, can sure. you explain us what is uh, Pygmalion effect and how to use it in our daily life? Ah, yeah. So, uh, so it's it's the notion that we we uh, it, it's it's taken from uh, the uh, what's the name of that play the original uh, Pygmalion, Pygmalion was the play by George Bernard Shaw 
but then it became a, a very famous uh, Broadway show. And oh. but what's the name? Of it? Uh, it's escaping me right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I can search it for you. I forgot it as well. You can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Using the technology. <laughs> I use the technology to figure this out. <laughs> so, uh, my fair lady. That's it. Yeah, my yeah. fair lady. Yeah, technology works. Uh, so, so in in my fair lady, uh, the the heroine uh, is transformed into this lady by her coach, and it's the notion of playing a role until you believe you can become the role, uh, and and. Another way of saying it, Shakespeare actually was the first to say this. He said it in more poetic terms, but he basically said, fake it till you make it. So when you play a role, you can embody and learn what that role has to teach you. And this is one way we grow as, as people overall, is we experiment and we take on different roles in life. Now, one of the big secrets of life is to play your roles very well, but to be free to move from one to the other so that you're not stuck, that you don't just identify with one role. Like I am a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, or I am uh, that whatever your profession is, or I am whatever your religion is. Uh, I'm a member of a church or whatever, or whatever. Uh, so, so part of the secret of life is to move smoothly and easily between different roles to be open to playing different roles but to remain inwardly free thank you michael michael i think this you like this uh, so can you share this story about morihei yashiba's about losing one center but finding it quickly oh sure sure so morihei yashiba was the founder of aikido and i studied aikido for many many years And one of the teachers I studied with was uh, uh, Sal Tome Sensei, who was a great, great master based in Washington, D.C. And Sal Tome Sensei had studied directly in Japan with O Sensei, Morihei Ueshiba. So Sal Tome told us the story that one day he said to Morihei Ueshiba, to O Sensei, he said, O Sensei, you're, you're, you're flawless, you're perfect. you never make mistakes. And O Sensei apparently said, oh no, I make mistakes all the time. I just correct them so quickly that you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, that's one of the secrets of life is, yes, we're all going to make mistakes, but how quickly can we recover? There's nobody, there's nobody, there's no person who goes through life without making mistakes. But the, the wise ones learn, first of all, not to make the same mistakes over and over again. We also learn to learn from other people's mistakes. So you know, I had a, a mentor who was 10 years older than me. I learned a lot from him, some of it directly, but a lot of it, I saw huge mistakes that he made. I said, well, I'm not going to make that same mistake. <laughs> but then we'll make our own mistakes, of course, and and. We want to recover quickly. We want to learn fast, develop change and grow. So that's where the humility, this is where there's a paradox that hum humility also leads to real confidence. Because if you give up your arrogance, if you give up your egotism, if you give up the need to be right all the time and instead embrace the idea of learning all the time, of growing and improving and developing all the time, then you develop tremendous momentum and speed in learning yes michael thank you that's one of my favorite stories i share that everywhere thank you uh, sure <laughs> michael 100 questions exercise the yes. most powerful exercise i have ever uh, did so it changed many people's lives so can you talk about that yes yeah, sure well so the 100 questions exercise i introduced it in how to think like leonardo da vinci the book came out 25 years ago and over the course of the 25 years that the book has been around the world 
it's probably the exercise that has generated the most letters and now emails from, from readers around the world. People say, I did this exercise, it changed my life. And in the exercise, it's very simple. We ask you to write down 100 questions in one sitting. Just keep writing, don't raise your pen from the paper. The questions can be about anything. You can choose a theme if you want, but you don't have to. Because what happens is the first 20 questions or so, you'll write what's just on your mind, your everyday thinking. The next 20 or 30 questions, you're gonna to start to get frustrated and tired and you'll write questions like, why am I doing this stupid exercise? But what happens if you get to 70, 80, 90, you get to 100 questions, it just shifts you out of your habitual part of your mind and gets another part of your mind, a smarter part of your mind engaged, the deeper part of your mind. Some people go on and they do 120, 150 questions. Some people do the exercise many every week over and over again because they find that it taps into the depths of their higher intelligence. You mentioned our friend uh, Brian Johnson before. Brian has this great global business where he's bringing together all the wisdom of the world. Well, that business was inspired yes. when he read How to Think Like Leonardo and did the 100 questions exercise. And he's just one of many stories like that. So it is, it is an embodiment of the first principle for thinking like Leonardo, which is curiosita. And it's a way to awaken your birthright of curiosity to tap into your genius power. That's beyond amazing, Michael. Thank you so much. Like, uh, I want to share just one thing that uh, if you follow something so deeply and you hear the person who wrote it speak it, it feels so amazing. Thank you so much. I'm having... Really good time. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Michael, why it is important to carry a journal with us? Yes. So, you know, when I wrote How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, it's true Leonardo was one of my childhood heroes. But the key to the book, and the, my seminars and all the teaching, was I asked this question. The question was, what is Leonardo trying to teach us because other people have written books about leonardo his life his biography his story his art what a genius he was and that is really fascinating but my question was different it's what is the message for us what can we learn from him so what i did is i read his notebooks with that question in mind and it turns out that leonardo in his notebooks gives lots of advice to his students so all I did was to translate that advice into contemporary language. Now, one of the things that Leonardo da Vinci tells his students to do is carry a notebook with you. Whenever you have an idea, write it down in your notebook. So, and we know, of course, that Leonardo did that because that's in his notebooks, <laughs> which of which there are about 7,000 pages that exist. Scholars estimate that another 7,000 approximately were lost to history. So if, if just Leonardo told you to keep a notebook, you'd probably say, okay, greatest genius who ever lived, probably good advice. But what if Thomas Edison, another incredible genius, living in a different part of the world at a different time, focusing on a different aspect of genius, which is business, invention, and innovation, what if Thomas Edison told the people who worked in his laboratory pretty much the exact same thing that Leonardo da Vinci told his students, which he did. Edison told all his workers to have a little notebook, keep it with you all the time. When an idea comes to you, write it down. Make creative doodles and drawings in it. See, da Vinci's notebooks are in the art museums of the world, because he's got these incredible sketches, amazing drawings that are so beautiful, exquisite. Edison's notebooks became 1,093 individual United States patents, which is still, still the record. Yes. But then you look at uh, Charles Darwin or Marie Curie, uh, and, and you see that they 
kept notebooks and they jotted down their ideas. It turns out one of the biggest differences between great geniuses and everyday people, an everyday person wakes up four o'clock in the morning, they have a crazy idea. They think I'm no genius and they go back to sleep. But Leonardo da Vinci or Thomas Edison or Marie Curie has a crazy idea. They wake up at four o'clock in the morning. They write it down in their notebook. Because the more you write down your ideas, the more that part of you, that genius part of you is encouraged to dialogue with you, to speak to you. Say, oh, you're paying attention. I will talk to you more. But the thing about that, part of you is it's it's not necessarily articulate it can speak in vague language it whispers to you right? it doesn't dictate clear so every so every now and then it does but usually it just gives you hints and clues and directions but as you write them in your notebook they become clearer and clearer and clearer that's fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think this is a uh, better question to ask at this point. How to tap into our unconscious database? Yes. So there, there's a part of us that's smarter than we are. You know, we think of ourselves as our everyday verbal mind that is having a little dialogue inside. And that's, you know, that's some people's everyday verbal mind that's having a little dialogue is smarter than others. <laughs> <laughs> but the smartest people use their, their verbal dialogue mind to ask questions of their nonverbal bigger database mind. And today, when this relates to what we're talking about before, today we can connect our own super mind with the global genius super mind so we because we have instant access to the world's knowledge if we're asking higher mind type questions and the questions are key it's the questions that unlock our genius it's the curiosity. That's why curiosity is the first principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. That's why that's the first chapter in the book. Because if you if you know how to ask those questions, if you wake up the curiosity, then then you will wake up that database. Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to you know take notes, write down the answers you get in your in your notebook, and and become more curious as you get older that's how you stay young oh wow that's so amazing thank you michael sure. michael how mind mapping can train us to become a more balanced thinker yes so my dear friend tony buzan sadly left this realm a few years ago but tony originated mind mapping and if you asked him, he would tell you that he was inspired by the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci and Thomas Edison. Because he saw that they drew lots of pictures and used lots of keywords. And it turns out that pictures and keywords are just more memorable than paragraphs and phrases and sentences. So the other genius thing that, that Tony came up with was the idea that most people try to organize their thinking before they generate their thinking. So they slow themselves down. You know, a lot of us learned outlining. What's number one? What's number two? And that's, that's, it's good to put things in order. It's good to have them very neat, but that's not the way to generate ideas. To generate ideas, you want to go in nonlinear, open, free, multivalent, expression first then organize so so t tony took these basic principles that are based on you know how memory works how geniuses think and he systematized them into the rules of mind mapping and the funny you know, so i met tony i was training in 1975 i was training as a teacher of the alexander technique 
in London. And Tony was taking Alexander Technique lessons at my school. And he had he had just released this book called Use Your Head, and he had a show on the BBC called Use Your Head, which was very, very popular. So he came to our school and talked about the brain and about mind mapping. And I went to the head of our school and I said, wow, that guy's a genius. I want to learn more from him. And the head of the school said to me, well, that's great that you say that because Tony said to me, who's that young American asking all those questions? I want to get to know him. So Tony and I connected, which was perfect because I was writing my master's thesis. And like most good university students, graduate students, I was I'd done all my research. But when it came time to write, I, I put down Roman numeral one. I was waiting for the first idea. Well, fortunately, Tony personally, directly taught me mind mapping. And he said, no, don't do that. He said, take a big sheet of paper, draw a picture in the center, and then go off in different directions and just print the keywords you think of, draw more pictures, and let your mind go free. So I did exactly what he said, and my mind exploded. Yes, it was a big mess, but when I stepped back, two things happened. First, I realized I knew so much more about the subject than I realized that I did. But the coolest thing that happened was when I looked at this big map I made, this was on the uh, wall of my flat in London. Uh, I, had, I had plastered it with big flip chart pages and I had big colored pens and I took a yellow highlighter. I looked at my big mind map and I said, what are the most important ideas? And it was so obvious what they were. I just highlighted them in yellow. Then I asked, what order should I put them in? That couldn't have been clear. It was just so obvious what they should be. Now, then what I did is I, I redid the mind map in clockwise rotation so it was easier to read and be more organized. And then I made a mind map of each of the major chapters that emerged from that. And I did the same process. I wrote this out longhand. That's how old this is. You know, there was no there were no word processors then. A friend of mine typed it up, sent it into my thesis advisor, who said, never in the course of my academic career have I seen a student's writing improve so much. He said, it's as though you found your true voice, which I did. And that thesis became published as my first book, which then got translated into 16 languages and has remained in print for 42 years. So mind mapping is how I became an international author. And all of my other books are written with mind mapping. When I do my executive coaching, we use mind mapping. When I help clients with strategic planning, we use mind mapping. And of course, I teach you how to do mind mapping in How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, because it is the tool for really thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. Wow. <laughs> Just wow, <laughs> Michael. Because uh, like I have done engineering and I wrote a couple of exams yeah. and everyone uses mind mapping. See, like you guys are the pros, original people. So I'm so happy to meet you. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Michael, yeah. for the story. Uh, Michael, now I think it's better to ask this. Can you talk about Alexander Technique? Sure. So the Alexander Technique is the method for developing stage presence to be poised and relaxed and at ease on stage. It's taught at the Royal Academy of Music and Drama in England, at the famous uh, Juilliard School in New York. It's taught at theater, music academies all over the world. When I first, when I first learned about it, I, I had a lesson I wasn't a musician, I wasn't an actor, I was an athlete, but I had one lesson and I was, f f my walking was transformed. I was floating. I felt so light and at ease and in balance. And I thought, that's amazing. I would like to have an Alexander Technique teacher with me all the time. But of course I couldn't afford that, so I decided to become one. And, <laughs> Then it turned out to be the perfect discipline to have studied 
because most of my career has been as a professional speaker now for many, many years. And in all the years of my career, I've never lost my voice. I've always felt completely comfortable on stage. And even though now I'm 70 years old, I can walk onto any stage anywhere in the world and and people will sense that there's that this 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 is a professional this is a natural this this guy why does he look so comfortable because i am because i've been training in the alexander technique for all these years and it also helps with the ease of the projection of your voice which is how i met my wife deborah <laughs> but she's a professional opera singer and she was studying the Alexander technique when she went to the Juilliard school. She was on a, she had a three-year scholarship, a professional scholarship to go to Juilliard. And when she was there, she was studying the Alexander technique and her teacher gave her my book, Body Learning, an introduction to the Alexander technique, which led her to go on a seminar where I was teaching. So writing that book proved to be the best thing I ever did. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for sharing that. Michael, what sure. is your view on affirmations? Oh, um, affirmations, like yeah. saying. Yes, so, yes. Well, I'm not against them. <laughs> uh, however, I think a lot of times they lead to... Uh, self-delusion and disconnection because if you affirm something but you're not really aligned with it unconsciously if you're resisting it you're setting up this internal tension so it's it's tricky it's a tricky business to help people find you have to find the affirmation that's really right for you in this moment that's really authentic that's really that's really true that's not just hypnotizing yourself into some form of self delusion that's going to create an unconscious reaction against something that isn't really true for you so it's it's somewhat nuanced to find what's what is right or true for a given person at a given time i try to help people find ones that are generally always useful <laughs> <laughs> and that are generally always always valid understood mike thank you michael what's the importance of learning how to draw Ah, oh, learning how to draw. Well, it's it's important in a couple realms. It, it's useful if you want to make mind maps. It's it's fun to be able to make drawings that look something <laughs> like what you're supposed to be representing. But there's a fascinating principle, especially for us as we get older, which is the worse you are at drawing, the better it is for you to learn it. And that's actually true with everything for adults so if you think you can't sing great learn to sing if you think you can't dance learn to dance if you think you can't draw learn to draw if you think you can't juggle learn to juggle because it turns out that when we take on things that are new and challenging that stimulates parts of our brain that are otherwise dormant and this is one of the keys to optimizing our neuroplasticity the ability of our brain to develop and grow and improve as we get older so a lot of times the reason people seem to get worse as they get older is that they're not doing anything new and they're not challenging themselves they're just doing the same thing over and over they have habits and they're doing the same things they're having the same opinions the same ideas the same sources of news the same types of activities over and over and over again they're not asking new questions 
So drawing is useful both as a wonderful discipline in itself, but also as a means to give your brain a fantastic workout to engage aspects of it that may have gone dormant after you had your last drawing class in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Time to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Michael, what are the top three lessons that you learned from Leonardo da Vinci? Well, there are more than three. <laughs> top three. <laughs> but I'll give you, I'll, let's see, I'll give you the top three. Uh, I think the number one, the number one is, and I learned this lesson really intuitively, because when I was a kid, my, my, my grandmother Rosa was, Ital was an Italian artist. She was a painter. She told me about Leonardo da Vinci. Now, when you're a kid, you know, my other hero was Superman. But as I got a little older, I realized Superman was only a comic book character, but that Leonardo was real. And the first lesson I really learned from Leonardo is that we have potential. We have abilities. We have talents. We have powers that we can all develop. So Leonardo, part of why he is so engaging for people 500 years after his era is he represents our human potential. So that's the most important lesson that there's more to us than we generally might be led to believe. And that potential, that creativity can be developed. So that's, that's number one. The second one is, is the first prince, curiosita. It is so consider what kind of questions you ask every day, because those will determine the quality of your life. And then if I had to choose another one, I would say it's the sharpening of the senses, sensazione, the third principle, the refinement of our sensory awareness, because this is one of the ways you enrich the quality of your life, you make life more beautiful, you develop your neuroplasticity. It's a huge part of the art of living, but you know we don't teach it in school and most most people don't get it, especially because they get addicted to their devices and then all is lost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Michael, thank you. Michael, how to be like Leonardo da Vinci in 21st century? Great, great, great. It's, 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 you know, it's more important than ever. It's easier than ever in a certain way if, if you're if you if you get it if you if you have the discipline to not be an addict uh, <laughs> then i mean what you leonardo would have if he was with us right now and we said hey wait check this out go ahead ask me a question about anatomy what do you what do you want to know about uh, the brain what do you want to know about uh, nature. What do you want to know about how plants grow? What do you want to know about the animal kingdom? What do you want to know about the flow of water? What do you want to know about Bernoulli's theorem and the fact that flight you know, actually happens now and, and why it's possible? Because we can find out instantaneously. Yes. Leonardo would go, hallelujah, because now now we can really integrate all knowledge, which is, you know, his goal was to know everything. His goal was to know the mind of God. He wanted to know the secrets of creation. So he would have leveraged the ability to know facts and everything that we're able to get access to. He would have leveraged all that to take the powerful questions he was asking and supercharge his responses. Yes, Michael, and I still remember that you said that if Leonardo was present in our society, he would be diagnosed on medications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he might be. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Michael, what are the top three things we can do to build our brain power? I'd say beyond the things we've already talked about, you know, learn something new every day, do things that are non-habitual, 
challenge yourself. The other most important one is to move, to stay healthy and fit, to eat well, to rest well, to love well, walk every day, be in nature. These fundamentals are more important than ever because people are losing touch with them. They're not eating well. Uh, they're sitting at, they're sitting too much. They're in front of their computer all day. They're not getting outside. They're not appreciating nature. So those universal old fashioned things are the best things we can do now to strengthen our, all of our abilities as we get older and then focus on learning something new every day, teach it to somebody else. <laughs> That's the best way. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Michael, can you talk about the art of non-doing? Yes. So <clears throat> this is uh, this is one of the great things one learns by studying the Alexander technique. See, what Alexander found out was that there's human, there's natural human functioning. I was. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. The other day we visited my mom and dad. They're 96 and 92 years old. And it was a family gathering because my youngest brother's daughter has a six month old baby. And the six month old baby uh, was visiting my mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> and the innocence the openness, the naturalness of this baby, just completely integrated, completely open, and thankfully, utterly happy, just at bliss and loving everyone and everyone loving the baby. It was just so beautiful to be, and the whole family felt all connected around everybody's love for and celebration of this new baby. So the baby doesn't have to do anything to it just is and everyone loves it and celebrates it but and that's what ch children are like they're natural they don't have to do something to be lovable and filled with life but then we go to school we learn we sit we learn the things we're supposed to do and not do and we start making effort and some efforts are very good some you know life does require discipline it does require different diff but we confuse effort and discipline with just being and we lose touch with our natural birthright of pure being and love and happiness so non-doing is to stop doing everything you're doing that interferes with the ability to feel your natural beautiful being at any given moment and the Alexander technique is a marvelously effective way to experience that. Thank you, Michael. Michael, you say that we should relearn how to rest. Why? How to rest? Yes. For the same reason, because hmm. the people don't rest. They're <laughs> restless. They're constantly on their devices. They're You know, I'm lucky I live, uh, we, we purposely moved to the countryside. We live, our, na our neighbors are cows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, sheep and goats and the river and uh, forests. Uh, what's great now, we're, we're blessed because we can get on the train and we can be in New York City uh, and right along the river. It's very relaxing. We, so we, we set our lives up. So home is a place of rest and revitalization that spurs our, our creativity. Uh, but for many people, they're not as lucky, they're not as blessed to be able to be in such a beautiful circumstance. And even if they are, they forgot how to rest. They can't relax because it's what we talked about before. We were born poised and at happy and peace and filled with life and love, but we have internalized from our crazy, the craziness of the world, anxiety. Oh my God, what's going to happen tomorrow? What happened yesterday? 
depression. Oh, I can't believe how terrible what happened was uh, and what's going to happen. And these are pandemics. These are the real pandemics, our anxiety and, and depression. So relearning how, how to rest deeply how to feel at peace in the moment. And that doesn't, I mean, if you're reading the news all the time, it's almost impossible. So you have to, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you something. I deleted my Twitter app from my phone a few weeks ago. I was teaching a seminar. They, I was teaching a five day seminar on Tai Chi. And, and you know, I, was, I needed to be a role model for my students of peace and poise and balance. And I said, if I'm checking this, it just makes me crazy. I'm just deleting the app because I can't discipline myself enough. If it's there on the phone, when you scroll by it, you go, like, oh, click. So I just deleted it. Gone. And I haven't missed anything. I'm still getting all the big news uh, when I need it. But not every little nonsense, yada, yada, crazy thing that was stopping me from resting. So you have to, you have to be, be focused if you want to be able to rest in the world today. Michael, I will do one thing right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. I hope you can see this is Twitter. <laughs> Delete that sucker. Please. Ah, bravo. <laughs> done. Okay. Excellent. Good. Done. It's done. Excellent. Good. 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 <laughs> Oh, we all, everybody's breathing easier now. We all, let's everybody else just delete that thing. And, right? uh, thank you for that because I, you are like a reminder. <laughs> you know what you can get instead? I'll tell you the app to get instead. It's called Artcast. Oh. Artcast. A-R-T-C-A-S-T. There's a free version and it's art. It just plays the art of the world like beautiful images of the greatest artists ever on your phone. We have it on our big, we have a big screen TV in our living room. So the default setting in our house is we have the paintings of Van Gogh or Monet, and they just cycle through on the big screen in HD all day. So it's like we live in an art museum <laughs> and then we have a 20 hour uh, Mozart track, which we play as our background music. I mean, you can obviously do whatever you want, but uh, you can get the paid version of Artcast. It's, it's, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, an affiliate. <laughs> this is a pure recommendation. You get the paid version is like six dollars a month. It's the best money we ever spent because then you get every genre of artist, anything you want. And you can just enjoy it. What well, I say, you could live in the greatest art museums of the world. This is what this is part of what I mean. Leonardo would go. You're kidding me, right? I can see all the great artists from everywhere for six dollars a month. Are you kidding me? Right here in HD in my living room. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, so you can see you can use technology. You can use our devices. To make our, I mean, we just say to, uh, you know, our device, what exquisite, incredible music we want to hear. And it, there it is instantaneously. How magical is that? But here's the thing. If you don't do this consciously, then you're just going to get the lowest common denominator of addictive garbage that you don't want, that you don't need that preys on your fears, your vulnerabilities, your addictions, and your desires. So it's really like every time you pick up your phone, there should be a button that says heaven and another one that says hell, because you're making that choice every time. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we go for heaven, right? <laughs> Michael, uh, so last two questions. Can you teach us any practical Qigong technique that we can use daily? So there, there's there's some free Qigong practices on my website, uh, on michaelgelb.com. Uh, if people go, I think it says other and scroll down, I, they'll find it. So I get so many requests for this and to teach it properly takes at least yes. uh, a few minutes. So we teach you there. There's a practice for just how to do standing meditation. And 
some of the simple basic practices uh, right there for free on michaelgelb.com. Awesome, Michael. Last question. Would you like to issue a seven-day challenge to our subscribers? Sure, seven-day challenge. Yeah, it would be each each day for the next seven days. Let's make it longer than seven days. Okay. Let's make it a 28-day challenge. Uh, each day for the next 28 days in your notebook. So we're going to mix in a few challenges. First, you're going to keep a notebook for 28 days. And in your notebook, you're going to write down each day something you can do on each of the 28 days to make your life more beautiful and something you can do to make life more beautiful for somebody else. And then just make a note of what you did for yourself and for somebody else. And then see if you can do something different the second day, the third day, the fourth day. And in 28 days, your life and other people's lives around you is going to be more beautiful. Yes. <laughs> So thank you so much, Michael, for coming to the show and uh, helping us to become more enlightened. And I enjoyed this so much. <laughs> so great. You have fantastic energy. Super curiosita. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Subscribe to BNS Goku. Great.